Bonsoir, Queen Island, good evening. Uh, welcome to the screening of uh, Sweet California Stops and Passes, part one, part two. Uh, we've been talking a lot of Bruce Bailey and Chicks Run the last few days. And um, um, Robert Nelson is also one of the most, I believe, one of the most influential and important filmmaker on the West Coast. And uh, this is a bit my evening because I've been hearing about the film for the last 15, 20 years without being able to see it. So I'm really happy. And uh, I let Mark Toscano, who created the program, the West Coast, a part of the West Coast program, have a few words of introduction. Mark. All right, thank you, Olivier and Philippe, uh, for, uh, as I've said in previous screenings, for bringing me here and to enable me to do these programs. It's been uh, really exciting. Um, when uh, these guys asked me to, well, to show two Chick Strand programs, but also three programs um, dealing with the West Coast, and not even specifically California, but just the West Coast, uh, I thought about it a little bit, but this um, this particular program was probably the first thing that came to my mind because of a few reasons. Um, one is that uh, Robert Nelson was probably, of all the filmmakers I've worked with, he was probably the most important uh, person to me personally that I've ever worked with, like by, by far. Uh, because I worked with him for uh, about 10 years uh, consistently until he died a few years ago. And he became a very good friend. Uh, he was definitely, uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say he also became almost like a father figure for me and like a mentor. And uh, it was under his influence I started making films again. I hadn't made films for many years myself. And so he, he and he was really um, a truly amazing guy. I can't begin to express uh, why he was so amazing. Uh, other than the, the effect that he had on me, I know he had on a lot of people. Uh, and, and so in some ways he was a little bit of a quiet influence um, to those of us that are a little younger. Um, we weren't around in the 60s and 70s when he was more of a big name. Uh, uh, he's maybe a lesser known filmmaker now and his influence is a little more invisible. But for instance, Peter Hutton became a filmmaker because of Robert Nelson. Uh, I mean, he was a painter, and then he encountered Bob and his films, and he and Peter told me this himself. He said, he realized, I didn't know you could make films like that, like that had humor, that had uh, kind of, that played with uh, formal structures in, in such a smart, but really funny, but also really thoughtful way. And uh, I mean, a lot of people have told me stories like that. James Benning, I mean, all kinds of people that um, he, that Nelson had some kind of influence uh, on in some way. Like he was very respected and very loved and then hated too. Like he made, he pissed people off regularly. Um, so, and he always regretted it later, but he, and sometimes he apologized and sometimes he didn't. So he, he really, really amazing, complicated, fantastic guy. Um, these two films, uh, for me, not only are they literally about the West Coast and about California, because it's two travelogue films. Originally, the plan was to make at least three or maybe even up to five or six, which would uh, cover the entire state of California, all of its areas. But he only finished these two. Um, the first one is about Southern California from the Mexican border, uh, including Death Valley and Hollywood. And then the second part is about the Bay Area and the Sierra Nevada mountains. So a little bit uh, the coast and then uh, inland a little bit, um, which is where he was from. And that's, that's significant uh, because the second film is much more personal. Um, but these films for many, many years um, were not available. Uh, he finished them. He took years to make them, starting... Uh, the, the idea for them goes back to even to the late 60s. And he made a few pieces of material in the late 60s. And then in the early 70s, he started to work really seriously on the first film. And then throughout the early to mid 70s, he worked very, very hard on it. And he was really, really proud of it, very excited about it. And when he finally premiered these films at the, I think it was at the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley in the mid 70s, he told me he, he, he watched the program himself with the audience, it was a full house. And everybody, uh, he thought everybody was going to erupt in a standing ovation at the end because he felt so good about these films. He's like, oh man, I really made something I'm so proud of and everybody's good. They're going to stand up and like cheer for me. <laughs> and the film ended and people were like, <laughs> it, it was not a standing ovation and he was utterly devastated. 
because he he couldn't figure out how he could have been so wrong. And my response to that many years later, when I was trying for about two years to convince him, hey, you should show these things, uh, was well, they I mean they were wrong. You were you were right, but you were right too early maybe. And so uh, he tried like recutting the first film, and then he was just going to throw away the second one and all this stuff. And he had a, a re-edited version of the first film, which has a lot of these same interesting stuff in it, but it really doesn't work. And then finally, uh, it, it, there, there was one um, copy of the film that existed at the Library of Congress in, uh, in Washington. And I asked um, them if I could borrow it <clears throat> because I'd never seen the complete version of the first film. And I, I watched it and I thought, holy shit, this is a masterpiece actually. And I had a long conversation with him about why I thought that. And he, as would happen sometimes with him, uh, he just was like, hey, okay, let's, yeah, let's save it then, let's show it. And he totally changed his mind because sometimes he just needed one person to tell him exactly what he was thinking almost like like he he knew why he made the film but for some reason no one had ever agreed with him or had, had ever responded um in the right way so uh so we made some new prints of both of the films and they've shown in a couple of places but not really yet very many places um but uh <clears throat> i don't know i could go on i'm, I'm just kind of blathering at this point. Um, you should really just see the films. Uh, but if you have questions, I'll, I'll come up after for a Q&A. Um, it's uh, about 90, 95 minute program, something like that. 95. But I'll be around. What's it? 95. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, 95 minutes. Um, and there's just like a short break between them because it's uh, there's leader in between the reels. Um, but I think that's all I'm going to say. So anyway, thank you very much for coming. much time if we have time we have to close at midnight but we have time for a few questions if you want to ask Mark a few questions don't hesitate I know it's a lot to absorb <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you it, uh, it was great um, just a question about uh, the way text is being used like uh, it seems that like, like all forms of text like titles and subtitles are have the same treatment but the, mm -hmm. the subtitles they just appear on some words and i was wondering if you have if you had any clues about what is the intention behind them yeah. um yeah, so the question was about the use of text, uh, and especially how he's mixing the purpose of the subtitles, uh, but also sometimes the titles are only appearing for some words. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ideas about the use of text in, in these films. Um, I think the starting point for me, uh, when I think about it, is the fact that a travelogue, typically, like a normal one, um, is an informational film, which is meant to be like a kind of encyclopedic documentary informational um, work, which is purely to inform you. And um, because in these films, he's created an extremely uh, sort of deconstructed subjective travelogue, which is also uh, in many ways uh, like a really elaborate home movie, especially the second part. I think his idea was to use the text, which begins in the first film as um, actual subtitles translating dialogue in a, like a kind of cheap Hollywood style movie. And, and then it transitions to being explanatory text about the, the landscape. And so it's informational. But then at some point when he tells the guy on the phone, I'll call you back, and, and all of a sudden his dialogue appears, it's kind of broken uh, through that wall of what, what, those, um, what the text is for. <clears throat> and then thereafter, uh, he's playing with it in a few different ways, and he's mixing the purposes of the text. So I think, in a way, it's it's uh, it, it was I think uh, a really interesting way for him to break the idea of well, what kind of information you're being told, and why, and what it means, and is it objective or subjective reality? Uh, and uh, and then in the second film, he's continuing this but i feel like by seeing the first film you sort of learn how the text works and then in the second film we're all experts now on how to read <laughs> i mean hopefully and some of the titles are deliberately very 
quick and you can't maybe can't read them or can't read the whole thing and um because just like also some of the dialogue the text is it's informational but it's also it's not necessary in a way too and so it's it's there but uh it's not the most important thing so uh yeah so he's kind of mixing these uh roles i think we can also all just go get a beer <laughs> Especially since we have to be out of here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Why he hasn't done a third and a fourth uh, movie? Because you said that he has done two films. Why not the third and the fourth? Oh, well, the third movie um, in the early '70s, uh, Nelson bought some land uh, in very northern California with uh, two friends. Uh, William Wiley, the painter, who he also made some films with, and then another guy. Um, and they, uh, over the course of several years, they built a house in on this land. It's really amazing. I've been lucky enough to go there a few times, and it's uh, really incredible. 120 acres of beautiful land in the mountains, about three hours north of San Francisco. And so that location in more Northern California also became very important to him. He raised his family there in the summertime and they worked on the house and spent a lot of time there. So originally the third part was gonna have some more of the San Francisco area and then going up North and the California coast. And he actually shot a lot of footage and I have it. It's actually sitting in my office right now at the archive because I don't know what to do with it. Um, but he put some stuff together and he had some ideas for it and then just never finished it for various reasons. Um, Partly because of the disappointing reaction to these two films, so it's kind of unfortunate. Uh, and then, like a few, maybe a couple years before he died, he he said, "Hey, I have all this stuff, so it's either going to go in the trash or you're going to take it." So I said, "Okay, I'll take it." <laughs> and so, but like I said, I'm not exactly sure what to do because it's um, incomplete stuff. But there's some really nice material, and a lot of it's shot up in in Northern California, so. I understand in, in the introduction you mentioned that uh, you made a first screening of, uh, of your movie and it was pissed off. Yeah. Of the well, the audience didn't really like it, I guess, or they didn't they didn't love it. Mm -hmm. but and you you also say that uh, you changed some details after. Oh, the the editing from the original. Yeah. Home yeah. He um the. Well, he he did put them in distribution and some they showed a little bit. They, I mean, they weren't, they weren't completely hidden. Um, but maybe only for about 10 years he had them in distribution, something like that. And because they never became classics, like his er so his earlier films from the late 60s are much more well-known, like The Great Blondino and Blue Shut and Odem Watermelons are probably his three most famous films, and they're all fantastic. But these films really didn't catch on in that same way. So they, they were shown here and there, and he would show them, he would make appearances, but it, not really that much um, compared to the other ones. And so in 2003, um, I mean, well, starting in the late 90s when he retired from teaching, he started to look at all of his films, and some of them he re-edited, some of them he destroyed, uh, some of them he tried to destroy, but he didn't succeed because he forgot that there was a copy that survived somewhere. Or <laughs> um, but some of them he totally destroyed and they were not restorable. Um, and the process that he would go through is he would take a print of a film and he would look at it and if he liked it, then he would leave it alone. But if he didn't like it, he would think, okay, what can I do to fix it? And some of them he decided, ah, I can't fix it and he would throw them away. And other ones he would try to recut them. So he would start with uh, cutting a print and just so trying different edits and things. Like he never liked the Spanish uh, language part of the first film because he felt embarrassed by it. Like he thought it was a bad joke that wasn't working. I think it's fantastic actually. But, and, and he also um, decided to change the position of that piece. So like he re-edited the first film really radically. And so it actually begins with Death Valley and he cut a lot of material out of the the Hollywood movie part, and then put it later in the film. And it really, it doesn't make sense anymore in a way because this part of the film is already itself a, like a detournement. And then like he's doing kind of a detournement of a detournement and it's like too many layers <laughs> removed from the original thing that it's uh, referencing. So it just doesn't work, I think, it kind of falls apart. 
And it actually, I mean, I showed it, I should, we showed it in Overhausen that way in 2006 when they brought him, because that's the only way he would let it be shown. And it still had a lot of brilliance to it, like the movie theater line. And I mean, there's some really amazing parts that were intact, but a lot of it was changed. And the second part, he just decided it's too much like a home movie. He didn't want to show it. But then after, I mean, he's always, he was always changing his mind about various things. And he would really, he was a guy, who, you know, I, 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 he was inspiring to me, actually, because a lot of older family members that I have, are the kind of people who are really conservative and they're really set. They once they decide something in 1947, they never change their mind <laughs> until they die. And Bob was constantly reevaluating things and very curious, and always open to changing his mind or trying something different. And so, it, at some point, he decided, okay, no, it's you can, yeah, show it whenever you want. <laughs> like it went from one extreme to the other sometimes. So yeah. Okay, well, thank yeah, you. That's good enough. Thank you. thank you all very much.